celebrated today for horses and bourbon, Kentucky has long been known for its abundant resources. Native Americans considered this to be a sacred hunting ground. The first European settlers found that same land to be fertile soil for growing crops of all kinds. Today, a new crop with an old history has come onto the scene of Kentucky agriculture. As farms are moving from tobacco and other traditional crops to growing grapes, a new tradition of Kentucky winemaking is also growing. The wine industry is very young. In 2005, we had about 15 wineries selling wine. We now have about 68, so it's grown. We're only 15 to 20 years old in Kentucky as compared to many other states that started in the 1860s and 1870s. The market is very well versed right now. You have distilleries, you have microbreweries, you have wineries. We're really starting and moving forward with that industry and um, really starting to have a cluster of good wineries doing good things, and it's growing. There's a demand for local products, and what better product than wine? Everything about it is it's more of a culture, and it very much is tied to the place. So if you want a sense of Kentucky, hopefully we can make wines that kind of represent what that is. The University of Kentucky is supporting this growing industry through an extension program and grape and wine research. Well, the main focus of our extension program and really any extension program is to help the community and um, educate the community and the industries through research-based education. I define my job as helping Kentucky wineries make consistently good wine by helping them with all kinds of knowledge at any time. The extension program makes me available to any Kentucky winery anytime, email, phone, letters, whatever on any problem. We also have an annual fruit and vegetable growers conference and trade show in January where we have about a day of lecturing for the wineries on various aspects of winemaking. Well, I'm a Kentucky native and so I absolutely love Kentucky and so I knew that I wanted to work somewhere in an industry in Kentucky. I started out as a research analyst at the university in 2005, and then in 2008 I took over as the extension specialist in viticulture. So I've been working with grapes in Kentucky specifically um, since 2005. And basically as soon as I started working with the crop, I knew, I knew that it was a crop for me. Great wine starts off in the vineyard, figuring out what grapes will grow the best in the state and how to make the best wine out of them is the work of researchers at the University of Kentucky's Viticulture Research Vineyard. Located on the south side of Lexington, the research vineyard includes four acres of vines along with an on-site winery. We have a vineyard team and I play a, a part in it and mostly has to do with overseeing most of the experiments that go on and making sure everything's being done in the right time because timing is very important in the vineyard. My role in the vineyard is to basically take care of it or, or manage it, I guess, essentially. I do all the spraying, make all the decisions, all the scouting for diseases. I have a master's degree in plant soil science and I've worked at a large commercial vineyard in Illinois. My experiences there have really helped in developing research programs or projects that are really well adapted or relevant to um, commercial grape production. When I went to school, I started out in forestry, but I pretty quickly realized that I didn't want to continue in that. And I took a couple of horticulture classes and immediately realized how much I liked growing plants and growing food for people. I had graduated with my master's degree program and we had a very similar research vineyard in Illinois. And so it was a natural transition for me. I really love what I do. That's the beautiful thing is really wanting to go to work in the morning, and I do want to go to work in the morning. It's a balance of science and art, but also um, things you can't necessarily explain. So you have to get your hands dirty, you have to be out in the field, and if you can get everything right, you can make a really nice product. In order to conduct the experiments, the research team must farm the vineyard itself 
following the same growing season as any farmer. Pruning will start somewhere in between November and March, depending on the size of the vineyard. I think one of the most satisfying parts in the vineyard can be pruning. You come to a vine and it all, has all this old growth on it and it looks all gnarly, and you cut pretty much 90% of it off and then it looks so nice and clean. We monitor the grapes and we'll also have to shoot thin. You gotta have the right spacing, the right number, um, in order to not tax the vines um, with too much fruit. And then the springtime comes and they start pushing out and that's a really cool time too to see how fast they're growing. And when they flower, they smell really good. And then it's nice to see them, how fast they can go from these tiny shoots to a, a full vine and a big canopy. As the season progresses, there's more thinning. Um, combing is one of the other things you have to do. That just allows for better air movement. It's a very important time to have the canopy nice and open and then apply these first sprays that are really determining how much disease you can have later in the year. What we're trying to do during the season is just make it easier to combat these diseases. That is really one of the limiting things for growing grapes in Kentucky is our climate and the diseases from our climate. So I'm hedging the tops of the, the canopies because if I don't do that, when they get tall enough, they'll just flop over and start shading the rest of the vine. So we're just trying to keep the canopy as harvesting as much sunlight as possible and as efficiently as possible. And the more that they flop over and shade each other out, um, the more humidity is in the canopy and the more chance for disease to develop. Once the grapes start to ripen and they'll start to change color and then they'll start to soften and that's going to be a point where pests, birds, bugs are going to want to eat it because it looks appealing because that's when we're about ready to eat it so of course it's appealing to us too but it's appealing to everyone else, all the other creatures and critters in the vineyard so you have to kind of protect the vines from those as well. You can see this is the bird damage and that's why we have to put on these nets because they'll just come in and peck those off. And so each one of these spots used to be a berry. That's funny that there's not an actual June beetle on here right now. There actually is inside here. See down in there. But those guys are the worst. So they just start feeding on these berries, but then they release a stink like on the rest of the cluster too and then secondary rots get into where they've opened the berries up so it can ruin a whole cluster if they just feed on a little bit of it. But sometimes there'll be 20 to 30 June beetles on a single cluster too. So it stinks because that's not necessarily a usable cluster now and it could have been a nice cluster. Bird netting is just a part of growing grapes in Kentucky. Basically, we'll net the vines right before, um, right around that 8% sugar when we're getting a lot of bird damage and then um, monitor the fruit chemistry and then determine when to harvest. I think everybody's favorite is harvest. It's a great time to see the wines developing out in the field. When you see all the color start to develop on the grapes and all that, you get to taste them periodically as they develop and they're increasing sugars and dropping acids so they're becoming more palatable and they're developing better and better flavors. UK's research team is investigating growing the grapes, pruning methods, and pest management. However, the key question researchers are seeking to answer is what grapes grow best in Kentucky? So far we've been doing broad cultivar research to try to see what varieties grow well around here and which ones don't. We grow up to 50 different cultivars here at the research center. We're trying to pick the ones that make the best wine and do the best in the vineyard. Each cultivar produces a specific type of grape and that grape um, then gets turned into a specific type of wine. So a Merlot grape will produce a Merlot wine. A Vidal Blanc will produce a Vidal Blanc wine. We're seeing how they grow in this climate, and so yield potential, disease issues, winter hardiness problems, any things that they would face, we're trying to get those before they plant them so we can tell them we had better experience with these in this climate, these ones did better, these ones didn't do as good, the pros and cons of all the different cultivars. The majority of our research is really uh, designed to um, help out growers in the state of Kentucky so that they can have businesses that are profitable. The end goal of the research farm is to support local farmers in Kentucky who are growing grapes to be made into wine. I'm the owner as well as the manager of Equus Run Vineyards and 
I do a little bit of everything, from the vineyard work to the marketing to the PR to the HR. Owning a small business and a small farm winery, you're really involved in everything in the vineyard and winery process. We started this operation here in 1998. I purchased the land in 1997. And the primary purpose was to start a vineyard and a winery. So we found this land here and purchased it from the gentleman across the street and started converting tobacco into grapes. So we started out still growing tobacco. And when I was 17, I was swerving down, I would never go back to growing tobacco. And what do I do? Buy a farm and start growing tobacco again. But the whole intention was to diversify in agriculture and to try something different. 15 years ago, we were a novelty, so to speak. And of course, now it's grown dramatically in Kentucky, the industry has. We are an agritourism business. We're about coming and having an experience, enjoying some wine, have a day in the bluegrass, go pet a horse and take a picture of a vine and sip some wine. But it's about that experience getting back and out into the countryside and enjoying Mother Nature and having a glass of wine. While the current wine industry in Kentucky is young, the state was the site of the first commercial vineyard and winery in the United States. The original site of the vineyard was lost over time until Tom Beale unknowingly purchased the property. My original intention was to just purchase it for a weekend getaway. I had planned to put an A-frame up here on the mountain overlooking the river valley. And it was later that we found out about being the site of the very first vineyard and winery in the United States. And that sort of altered my plans. Kentucky's known as being uh, one of the first commercial vineyards in the United States. We have a, a big history of, of grape growing here in the state. Swiss immigrant Jean-Jacques Defour established the first commercial vineyard in 1799 on a site in Jessamine County. One of the things he done was he surveyed this property and I found a copy of his survey in Indianapolis, Indiana at the Indiana Public Library. It says specifically right in the deed that this was the vineyard track so there was no doubt as to where it was. Defer talks about terracing it, like he did in Switzerland, and using the rock to make a rock wall around it. So we knew that it had to be a terrace piece of property, we knew it had to have a rock wall, we knew it had to be located overlooking the Kentucky River with southern exposure. So even before we found this deed, we knew in fact it was where the vineyard and winery was. Plus we found the foundation of the old winery. It's like most business ventures, most of the time people don't have the capital to start it up themselves. So what he basically done, he solicited some people in Lexington and uh, he eventually actually had 113 different people that got involved in it. And some of the people who would probably easily recognize would be like Henry Clay was both the attorney and a stockholder. You had James Garrett who was a governor of Kentucky. You had nine members of the House of Representatives. It was almost like a who's who in America. It lasted until 1809, and what happened in 1809, it was a real freak of nature. They had a hard freeze for days in May, which of course decimated the crop, but not only did it decimate the crop, it destroyed many of the vines. The DeFores left Kentucky, but other producers continued growing grapes. By the 1850s, Kentucky was the third largest wine producing state in the country. We've started with the history of, of grape growing since the 1800s, but then once Prohibition came along, um, most of those vineyards were taken out. Our heritage was lost totally until probably about 15 or 20 years ago when there were some individuals here in Kentucky that took the initiative to start it up again, and we've got some wonderful vineyards and wineries now. There's been a lot of interest in grape production, um, and then especially with the tobacco settlement money. Grapes became a very important crop, and people became very interested in planting grapes as an alternative to tobacco. We were in the cattle business and in the tobacco business. So we basically just had a cow herd and had our tobacco quota. And then after the government bought out all of our quotas, we were at a turning point in our farming career and decided to look at some other options for our farm. One thing that really uh, impressed us about grapes and the possibility of making wine is that we could grow the grapes and have an added value product. 
And that was something that really we were searching for. We knew that Kentucky was a big grape growing region prior to Prohibition. So we thought we had the climate and the soil that would support that crop. So that's how we started and uh, got our feet wet and here we are today. Making the transition from more typical Kentucky crops to grapes can be a hard one. Many of these farmers didn't have a background in working with perennial crops. We're really a very nervous about that, but you know, we were farmers, so uh, growing grapes is all about farming. And we had the equipment, we had the land, we had the support from uh, the University of Kentucky, which provided a lot of knowledge for beginner growers and um, found a lot of good networking out there, so we just got into it and learned by doing. With a long history of grape growing in Kentucky, there is still much to be learned about making a great Kentucky wine. While the wine begins in the vineyard, selecting the right time to begin harvesting starts the winemaking process. We go through beforehand and we take pre-harvest samples, which we usually take at least 50 berries, but maybe 100 berries for the variety. And so we'll go through and try to take a random sample from different parts of the cluster, different parts of the canopy, to try to get a representative sample of all the fruit that's there for that variety. We're looking at fruit integrity first in the field, so whether the fruits sound out in the field, and then looking at ripe, the ripening process. The number one thing we're looking at usually is the sugar accumulation in the fruit, so we're monitoring that constantly. As they ripen, the sugar levels are rising and the acid levels are dropping, and so you want to try to find the right balance when they still have acid, because acid's really important for wine characteristics and mouthfeel of the wine. Um, but the more sugar you have, the higher alcohol you can have, but too much sugar can either lead to too much alcohol or problems with fermentation and things like that. The vineyard is where you get the flavors. We don't have a way to put that in if the vineyard doesn't put it in. You can't really make high, ex high quality wine without having extremely good fruit. So the winemaker's job is to preserve the quality of that good fruit that's, that's grown out in the vineyard. While harvest is beginning on the research farm, it is also underway at commercial vineyards. At the Talon Vineyard and Winery, Kerry Jolliffe is head winemaker. We grow about half of what we use, and then I work with other growers around the state to buy the other half. And in any given year, I'll be working with 12 or 13 different kinds of grapes. I can blend those in different amounts or leave them by themselves and create the different flavors and different wines. And all of the flavors that you get out of a wine come from the grape. And the flavors will vary year to year, depending on the climate of that growing year. As the grapes are brought into the winery, the process of turning fruit into wine begins. The grapes are brought in and crushed first. They're removed from the stem, crushed, and from that we get what we call the must, which is just a mixture of the seed skins and juice. Grapes that are used for white wine, um, the fruit goes directly into the press where we um, separate the seeds and skins from the juice. And once it's settled, then we rack off of what we call gross leaves. It's the, the sediment from the grape berries themselves after they're pressed. Racking is a term we use to, to describe how we move the wine from one tank to another. And then after we rack off of that leaves, then we start a fermentation. While the white wines are separated, red wines are left with the seeds and skins during fermentation. Yeast are added, fermented. After that, it's cloudy, so there's a few rackings involved. After fermentation, then we're wanting to stabilize the wine and prevent any oxidation. Sulfites are added to the wine to prevent oxidation, and the wine is racked again. And then from, from that point, it's a series of settling and clarifying before we can go into blending and bottling. It actually starts to clear up and look like wine. And from that point, it's blended, stabilized, balanced, bottled. And the white wine process takes about six months to a year, depending on how the wine's clarified and how much aging you want to do to it. If you want to have any oak aging or anything like that, Sometimes it can be longer. It just depends on the style of the wine that winemakers wanting to make. We bottle maybe 15 times a year. We can bottle whites as soon as maybe three months after fermentation. The wine is pumped into the bottling line and the bottles are filled, the level checked, 
uh, cork added, the capsule put on, the label spun on, and out comes a completely packaged product. Turning grape juice into wine is a chemical process. Managing that process to create a specific type of wine involves both science and art. There's certain fundamentals that you need to understand. Wine chemistry a little bit, maybe some understanding of yeast and microbiology. But once you understand the fundamentals of winemaking, then it's just practice. There's probably two schools. There are probably winemakers who think of themselves as scientists and therefore it's all science, and artists who think of themselves as wine, yeah, so. But it's a mix. So without the science, you can't really make a great wine, but without some sort of artistic interpretation, you can't make a great wine either. You work all summer on these grapes, and you're not sure how they're gonna turn out. And so this time of year, there's always a little nervousness, but I can tell as soon as the wine is fermented and pressed whether it's gonna be good or not. Especially the, the reds that you have to tuck away and age in the barrel a couple of years. I know going in that, boy, that's gonna be a nice red. And that, that feels really good. The research and extension programs at the University of Kentucky support not only the grape growers, but also the winemakers around the state. My job is to transmit, transfer uh, winemaking knowledge to all these people that are struggling to make a, an excellent wine. Jim White was an amateur winemaker who turned his personal passion into a family business. Started making our wine in August 2006 as a licensed winery. Opened the doors in 2007, the end of August, with our own products, and we've never looked back. We've been uh, quite successful at what we're doing. Uh, we're one of the highest award-winning wineries in, in, in Kentucky. I think we all can improve on our quality as far as uh, having good, presentable wines out there. I also think that we have another level to attain in, in getting into fine wines. Years ago, it was bomb and pop's recipe and throw this together and that together and put it in the barrel and let it ferment. Now it's, this has become a chemistry business. First of all, you have to know the science of the fruit that you're getting. You have to interact with your grower through the season to see what kind of product you're getting, to know what kind of wine that you're gonna be able to make, or even if you can make wine from it. We, we have close relationships with the growers. We know exactly what's going on in the vineyard, so it's no surprise when the, when the product comes in that it's gonna make good wine. We want to take wine to the next level in Kentucky. We want to get people there that, that know fine wine and introduce them to Kentucky fine wine. The future of the wine industry in Kentucky seems bright. At the University of Kentucky, the research and extension programs continue to move forward, and now the next step of preparing students for the industry is beginning. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of wineries and vineyards going in in the state of Kentucky. Students want to have jobs, and I, I think that it's a rewarding career to pursue, and there's a lot of interest for it. But I think that the, the biggest potential is gonna be the incorporation of students into the, in the production of wine and training students for um, employment in the industry. There's a lot of interest in great production and there's a lot of people that want to buy high quality Kentucky wines. And so I just see that continuing on as we move forward with um, working with the industry and our research program here at the university. Through research, education and experience, the Kentucky wine industry is growing. This new era of great production and winemaking promises to become another great Kentucky tradition.